There are certain things about the Christian life that I absolutely love. I was reminded this morning as we were singing how much I love to sing with the body of Christ here at Lakeside. We are blessed with a gifted man like Joel to lead us, but so many talented musicians with great instrumental skills and great musical skills, and then the rest of us who make a joyful noise, it's a lot of fun. I think it's a foretaste of what heaven might be like, and I cannot wait one day to be singing with you all there. But one of the things that is probably my least favorite aspect of the Christian life are the daily struggles against sin and against the things that hinder our walk with the Lord. I've shared my testimony many times in various settings here at Lakeside, but I was saved in 1993. I was a relatively young man, 26 years old. And I grew relatively quickly in my knowledge of the word. Certainly there were some sins that I was able to deal with relatively quickly. My foul mouth and a few other things that seemed to go away quickly. But then I settled in for the long haul and I realized there are certain things that are just hard to overcome. It's a daily struggle. It's a yearly struggle. And so over the last umpteen years of being a believer, I've come to know my weaknesses very well. And as a general rule, I hate them. I long for the day when I won't have those struggles. I long for the day when there isn't a battle against the world and there isn't a battle against my flesh. When we are able to stand together in heaven, one of the great things to me, apart from the presence of Christ, is the absence of sin and temptation. One of the paradoxes almost of the Christian faith, and some of you will have experienced this, some of you will experience this, is as God begins to grow you and as you understand his word and you begin to obey more and more and you begin to feel like you're making progress in the faith, the paradox is that the more godly you become, the worse you realize you really are. You should feel good about getting better, except that you're only seeing more clearly how much residual filth resides in you. In Romans 7, I'm going to read verses 15 to 21, the Apostle Paul encapsulated sort of what I'm talking about, a struggle that I think you can identify with as a believer. We've been redeemed, we've been born again, we have a hope in heaven, and yet we still live in these bodies. Beginning at verse 15 of Romans 7, the Apostle Paul says, For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, the sin which dwells in me. I find in the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. That's the struggle of our life. And Paul in no way, and I'm not teaching on Romans, he's not saying we're not responsible. He's just acknowledging as long as we have these bodies We're going to have that battle. God calls us to holiness. We understand that. He calls us to obey his word. We understand that. And yet daily we stumble and fall. One minute we can be on the mountaintop praising the Lord saying, isn't this wonderful? And it seems like the next minute we find ourselves in a pit going, how did I get here? Like Paul said, I I, I didn't want to do that and, and I did it. And I wanted to be doing this, and and I didn't do it. We prove the reality of what the Apostle James said, the first part of James 3, 2, for we all stumble in many ways. I know this all too well, and I think you do. Life is hard. We struggle. 
even as believers, even in a well-taught church like this where the word of God isn't being covered over, it's being unfolded for us so that we see clearly God's expectations and yet we still struggle. Again, I know this not because I've been watching you, not because I'm a pastor here dealing with some of these issues. I know this because every day since I was saved in 1993, I look in the mirror and I see me. I know my struggles. The challenge for us is how do we keep going? How do we keep pressing on when it's not just a year of struggles, but it's 10 years and 20 years, and for some of you, 40 and 50 years of walking with the Lord and still struggling? Probably 10 or so years ago, I I was discouraged, even though I knew It was reality, and I heard a testimony of some 85-year-old man that was talking about struggling with sin, and I'm like, 45 years from now, I'm still going to be doing this? The point, though, is not to give up. How do we keep pressing on? How do we keep coming forward? How do we keep trying to obey despite our failures and struggles? Love to be here on Sunday and the worship and everything seems good, but then we walk away and for some of us, we feel like we're alone, struggling. At times, it can feel hopeless. At times, even believers can lapse into depression, thinking it seems hopeless. Can't I ever get past this? Am I always going to struggle with this? Is this going to be my life? Can't I be more consistent? Can't just once I persevere? Can't I just daily read into the scriptures? If you know nothing of what I'm talking about, I encourage you to listen anyway. But if you can identify with me, I hope that I encourage you as I hope that I encourage me today. Because we're in a portion of the book of Hebrews, as you know, when I have the opportunity to teach, I've just been teaching verse by verse through Hebrews. We're in Hebrews chapter 11, and Hebrews chapter 11 is really a catalog of faith. It's a hall of faith, as it were, being presented to these original hearers who were Jewish Christians, and these Old Testament saints were being held up as examples for them. And what you see throughout the chapter over and over is by faith, by faith, by faith. These men and women that are held up as examples are supposed to encourage believers like us. There are believers before the flood even came to the earth, Abel and Enoch and Noah, And believers from the era that we refer to as the patriarchs of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and even Joseph. And the particular text we're in now is part of a section dealing with the life of a man named Moses. His parents' faith were put on display already. But we're going to be looking this morning in verses 27 to 29 of some events that occurred in the life of Moses that are supposed to encourage us. These characters aren't in the Bible for us to look at and go, wow, I wish I could be that way, but I can't, it's impossible. No, the expectation is we'll look and say, yes, I want to be that way, and it is possible for us. These aren't superheroes. These are flesh and blood humans with the same struggles that we have who by faith did remarkable things. Why do I even think any of this would be encouraging? I mean, that's a long time ago. That's thousands of years ago. I mean, these are famous people, but what's that got to do with me? I'll tell you what it has to do with you. Every time I preach out of Hebrews 11, I read Hebrews chapter 12, which explains why we're studying this. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, explains why Hebrews 11 and everybody in it is in the Bible. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance... And the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. 
I think for a lot of us, we need that because we do grow weary. We're tempted to lose heart, and it goes back to those encumbrances, those extra things that weigh us down, and the entanglements of sin that seem to trip us up. So what Hebrews chapter 11 is doing, including our text this morning, is it showing us how in the midst of this race that we're running, which is called our lives, do we fix our eyes on Jesus? That's the hope. Throughout this month, it's December, we're going to be thinking about Jesus. We're going to be thinking about him being born. That's what Christmas is all about. But the goal for us today is not just to think about a baby in a manger, but to think of our Savior and to practically put into place things in our lives that will help us to look to Jesus to overcome the encumbrances and the sin so that we can run the race. In fact, the way I'm outlining the message this morning has to do with the idea of a race just from uh, Hebrews 12. This idea that every one of us, every one of us is in a race not to compete to go against each other, but we're trying to help each one of us get across the finish line. That's the type of race it is. It's not who gets there first. It's make sure we all get there. And that's what we're doing. So we're going to be looking at our text this morning about Moses and events in his life in the nation of Israel. And the idea is that we're trying to help each other get to the finish line. We would understand if we look around in a natural race and we take off, some people are going to get there first, probably all the young guys. And there's some people that can't walk, literally. But the goal is we're not leaving anybody behind. The goal isn't to get there first, it's to make sure that we link arms and we get there together. And so my hope is to encourage us along the way. Now, as I mentioned to you, we're going to be looking specifically at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 27 to 29, but there's a little bit before that about Moses. Now, I've preached on this, but I want to give a little background before we jump into our text. Moses is probably the most revered man in Judaism. Abraham was the father of the Jewish people, but in day-to-day -day life, Moses was the author of the law. We understand God wrote the law, but Moses was the lawgiver. And so in the life of a Jewish person, the original recipients were Jewish Christians. There was no greater name than Moses. So I think in some respects, some of the details of Moses' life didn't need to be laid out in, in comprehensive detail to them because he was the hero of their faith. But the writer recounts lives. Even how he stayed alive was by faith of his mother and father, disobeying a command of the king of Egypt. But Hebrews only recounts snippets of his life. You could find detailed accounts in the book of Exodus, but also in other Old Testament books, other places in the New Testament. So what of his life? Let me give a big picture. He lived to be 120 years old. That's according to Deuteronomy 34.7. Moses lived 120 years. That's a long time. And many people that I have read about, he's one of the first people that I was taught about, they would divide his life up into three segments, 40, 40, 40. The first 40 years, according to the scriptures, and I'm not giving you all the verse references, but I could show you from scripture all these things. He basically, after his parents disobeyed the king and they didn't kill their son, and they hid him for a while, and then he was found by Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter let him be nursed by his mother. She didn't know it was his mother. Then he was the adopted child of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. excuse me. So Moses' first 40 years were really spectacular. According to the book of Acts, he was learned, he was powerful, he was a gifted man, he was the cream of the crop of Egyptian royalty. Moses lived everything. He would have had unlimited wealth, he would have had unlimited power, he would have had unlimited servants. He was a gifted man raised in the ultimate privileged setting. This is at least hinted at in Hebrews 11, 23 and 24, talking about his life and being saved. But in verse 25, it makes it clear he walked away from all of that. He had everything, but he decided he wanted to identify with God's people. He was going to identify with Christ in whatever revelation he had. He knew of God's Messiah, and he was willing to walk away from all the wealth, all the power to identify with God's people. And as I've taught on that before, he identified by defending an Israelite. There was an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew, probably 
Best understanding is he was probably beating the Hebrew to death, and to save his life, Moses stepped in and killed the Egyptian. That occurred around when he was 40 years old. He had gone to sea with the condition of his people, and while he was living the great life, the people were slaves. It was a miserable existence. But rather than being thankful, he wound up having to run away. Because even the Hebrew people heard that he had committed a murder. In fact, as he tried to stop two of them from fighting, they said, what, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Moses knew he had trouble. And sure enough, the Pharaoh at that time wanted to kill him. And so Moses went away. Second period of his life, the second 40 years, is really the middle of nowhere. He went to, from the palace to the wilderness. Now, we know from Scripture, when he went away, he wound up getting married. He wound up starting a family. But he was tending pastures he was tending flocks and then we know from scripture that God came to him at what we refer to as the burning bush and said you're going to deliver my people I hear the cries of my people you're going to deliver them and we're getting close to where we are this morning in the text so we're at the text this morning at the beginning of the last 40 years of Moses life probably from a purely ministerial standpoint the most productive years of his life This is when he was the deliverer of the nation of Israel. He was the leader of the nation of Israel. And Hebrews 11 makes clear he's a man of faith, but he was a man like us in many ways. What do I mean? When God called him, he didn't want to go. In fact, he had a million excuses for why he couldn't go. But ultimately, he went. And he came to Egypt, where he'd been gone for 40 years, and that really gets into our text this morning. So we're going to see some more background, but this brings us to the doorstep of our study. So look with me as I read, and you follow along, as we see Moses' faith on display and also its impact on the nation of Israel. Beginning at verse 27 of Hebrews 11, by faith he left Egypt. Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. Now I want to help us see how these ancient events actually should help us live today. So I mentioned before, I'm I'm putting my outline in the imagery of that race that we're all running and we're trying to get to the finish line together. And so I have a three-part outline of our text this morning, three verses. Each one's going to be a point of the outline. And I have it labeled three principles for overcoming obstacles in the pursuit of obedience. Three principles for overcoming obstacles in the pursuit of obedience. And the first principle is this. Fear God, not man. Fear God, not man. Going back to verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Now as we begin to look at this, we actually have to address a little bit of a controversy that starts at verse 27. It says, by faith, he left Egypt, but we've got a little bit of a challenge. Moses left Egypt twice. What's he talking about, the first time or the second time? What's the first time? Well, I've already alluded to it in general. Moses killed an Egyptian. The Pharaoh at that time, the king found out about it, and Moses fled so that he wasn't killed. Exodus 2.15 says it this way, When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So the first time Moses left Egypt, he was running. Pharaoh was trying to kill him. He got out just in time. He didn't die. The second time was, of course, the Exodus. 
We, we know this if you've been around the Bible very much, but if you haven't, the Israelite people, God's people, were in slavery for 400 years, and at one point, God led them out of Egypt by Moses. In Exodus chapter 12, verses 30 and 32, it says this, Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, rise up. Get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go and bless me also. So the first time Moses left, Pharaoh was trying to kill him. The second time Moses left, along with the nation of Israel, it was a situation where ten plagues had come upon Pharaoh, and he had finally had enough. So which are we dealing with today? By faith, he left Egypt. I think what's being referenced here, even though I understand that some godly men think otherwise, I think what's being referenced here is the second leaving the Exodus. That's why I'm going to be focusing on the last 40 years of Moses' life, really the beginning of those last 40 years, because I think what our text is saying has to do with the Exodus from Egypt. Why do I say that? By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. That's ultimately going to be our encouragement. But it says, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. I think the author is clearly talking about a time when Moses confidently left Egypt and he didn't care what Pharaoh could do to him. This makes it hard to equate it with the first event. I'm not going to read it for time's sake, but in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 15, it's the account of him coming upon and killing the Egyptian. But I will will read at verse 14. But he said, who made you a prince or judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? In other words, the two Hebrews that Moses was trying to break up were saying, look, we know you killed the Egyptian. Is that what you're going to do? What does it say? Then Moses was afraid. And said, surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of the matter, he tried to kill Moses. That's hard to reconcile with what Hebrews eleven twenty seven 27 says. Not fearing the wrath of the king. Moses, it seems, was very afraid of the wrath of the king. So I think what we have here is a situation where even though Moses was already a man of faith the first time he left Egypt, that's not what's being referred to here in Hebrews 11. I think what we see in our text this morning is that Hebrews 11, 27 is a summary statement and then verses 28 and 29 aren't chronologically there. What they're doing is explaining part of the leaving. The big picture that we're looking at in 27, they left. 28 and 29 are just some aspects of the leaving. This becomes more, I become more convinced of this with something that God said as he was calling Moses out of the wilderness. Now again, Moses had fled and he stayed there for 40 years away from Egypt. And he was living his life and he started a family. And God called him at the burning bush. And as I alluded to before, Moses didn't want to go. Well, wait a minute. I'm not eloquent. I can't speak really well. Will they listen to me? I mean, if they ask who sent me, what's your name? Who are you? What if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? And God had an answer for every objection. And even though God took out every objection, Moses and essence said still, well, can you find somebody else? Exodus 4, 13 and 14. But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will, meaning by whomever you will, not me. Verse 14, then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And he said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. Now when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. In other words, God said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll send Moses. Uh, Excuse me, I'll send Aaron. Tired of hearing of your excuses, you're going. I'll send Aaron with you. Now here's what's relevant for our purposes. Exodus 4, 19 makes this statement. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt, 
For all the men who were seeking your life are dead. Seems like God was aware one of the things going on in Moses' heart was he was still scared 40 years later that those guys were trying to kill him. And God's just saying, look, they're gone. Don't worry about that. So I think when we get to Hebrews eleven twenty seven, we're looking at a time when Moses was 80 years old, and we're looking at the time of the Exodus. And it says, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. The writer doesn't explain a lot of details. He doesn't go through all the plagues that preceded this. He doesn't allude to everything. In the next verse, he's going to allude to the plague of the firstborn that killed all the firstborn of Egypt. But these original Jewish hearers would have understood that by the time Moses left Egypt, there had been a lot going on between Moses and the then Pharaoh. Moses, by this point, was doing what God said. He had to be kicked and dragged, so to speak, by God out of Midian. He came following the Lord. And time and time again, he went back to Pharaoh because God said, go, and he went. And whereas at one point in his life, he had run away in fear from a king of Egypt, a different king of Egypt, because he didn't want to die, now he was fearless. Now he didn't care. He was going to do what God said. What's the difference? For he endured as seeing him who is unseen. For he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Here's what happened. Moses ultimately came to the point where he truly had a healthy fear of God. I can't imagine how bold you are to tell God no as many times as Moses did. No, no, pick it somebody else. But once God got a hold of his life, Moses became fearless. He endured because he began to trust in the God who he couldn't see. He didn't actually see the unseen God. He just believed him. He knew him. God has made his presence known to him. And what he knew above all else was that the God of the universe was involved in his life. He had faith in the invisible God. It calls to mind the definition of faith given in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We need what Moses had. The conviction that the God that we can't see is there for us. The conviction that the God we can't see is real, that his power is still on display. Such that when he calls us to obey, not by some miraculous sign like a burning bush, but by the simple truths of the words of Scripture, we can fix our eyes on him and say, we're going to get there. We're going to see some of what makes that more clear in just a moment. But humans, you and me, are limited a lot by fear. We're afraid of a lot of things, and if you boil down most of our fears, they ultimately come back in too many circumstances to a fear of man. Well, but I may lose my job if I make my boss mad because I'm not willing to compromise my faith. It's a fear of man. Well, they might get a little offended if I don't go along with them when they start talking about these new secular things in society, if I cling to what the Bible says, they might ostracize me. Well, if I share my faith with them, they might not like it, and then they might, it's going to be awkward, and that's just going to be terrible. I better stay back. I mean, we fear the government. Well, but we don't want to do this, or they're going to take away our rights, or we fear, we fear, we fear, we fear, and we fear because we take our eyes off of Jesus. If you picture all of us in the race going towards the finish line, what we're doing is we're looking side to side at all the dangers along the way, and we're taking our eye off the prize. Moses came to the point 
despite all his hurdles, despite all his fears, despite everything else, where he became fixed on the person of God, such that he feared God more than he feared even the Pharaoh who could have killed him. I think for us, we need sometimes to remember the truths For example, in Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? You know, the most any man can do to any one of us is kill us. Unless we forget, for believers, that's not the worst thing. But beyond that, the scriptures say this in Matthew 10, 28. Do not, fear who those, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And that's not talking about Satan. That's talking about the God of the universe. So as we're dealing with those struggles, as we're dealing with those hindrances, as we're dealing with those things that make us afraid to obey Keep your eyes on Jesus. Fear God, not man. The second principle for overcoming obstacles in the pursuit of obedience is this. Obey scripture even when you don't fully understand. Obey scripture even when you don't fully understand. Now I'm going to develop the point a little bit, but it comes from verse 28. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. Now, the center of Jewish life was the Passover. So the original recipients probably would not need as much explanation of this as we might remove from that so far. But the Passover was part of the events of the Exodus. The institution of the Passover was a part of the nation of Israel leaving Egypt. There's so much information I can only summarize some things for you. But Moses meticulously followed God directions when it came to instituting the Passover such that it is an example of faith to us. Not only that, he was so meticulous in articulating what God expected that even the Israelites who were not known for always being quick to obey were able to actually do what God said and be saved. A brief summary of what's going on I think is all we need to get the full import of this. There were nine devastating plagues of various forms that afflicted Egypt. God had sent Moses to the Pharaoh over and over and over, and there were all kinds of plagues. And some of the plagues, the Egyptian magicians could duplicate, and then some of them, they said, that's, that's God. We can't do that. And yet, after these nine devastating plagues that had taken an incomprehensible economic toll on the nation of Egypt, the Pharaoh's heart was still hardened. He still didn't let the people go, and God always knew there was a tenth plague coming. But that tenth plague was unlike anything else. Exodus 11 verses 4 to 6 summarizes what that tenth plague would be like. Moses says, Exodus 11 beginning of verse 4. Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I am going out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and such as shall never be again. God was saying, this is what's going to break Pharaoh's back, and the people are going to be gone. But God didn't just bring a plague. God put a lot of things in motion to prepare for this event. And God actually reordered the life of his people who for hundreds of years now had been slaves in Egypt. He was reordering everything even down to the calendar. Exodus 12, 2 says, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. is to be the first month of the year to you. And then he set up the Passover. Everything was centered around that. 
The directions were very specific of what the Passover was going to evolve. And again, this all has to do with God was going to destroy the firstborn in Egypt. Exodus 12, 3, and this is all in Exodus 12. You can come back and read the whole thing later, but Exodus 12, 3 says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. And then this specific lamb that they were supposed to take of a certain type, they were going to kill it at a certain time. Every one of them were supposed to do it. Verses 5 and 6 of Exodus 12. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation is to kill it at twilight. Then they were supposed to do something with the blood of the lamb. Verse 7, moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. So they would cook the lamb. They had to eat it a certain way, cook it with certain spices. I mean, there was a lot of going into this, a lot of detail from God. And after doing all that, they were supposed to be packed and ready to go. Be ready. And this wasn't just a matter of, well, be good, this is a good idea. It was a matter of life and death. Continuing chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. For I will go through the land of Egypt that night, on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I, light, when I strike the land of Egypt. If there's blood on the house, people live. No blood, people are going to die. Continuing down to verses 22 and 23, reiterated. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lentil and the two doorposts and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptian and when he sees the blood on the lentil and on the two doorposts the Lord will pass over the door and, you will, allow the and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. Verse 28 summarizes all of that in a few words. By faith he kept the Passover in the sprinkling of blood. Moses followed God's directions. And when God said, tell this to all the people, and we know from elsewhere in Scripture, over 600,000 men were a part of the nation of Israel, which means there were well over a million people when you add in the women and the children, all affected by this, and Moses had to get out the word, do this. And it was by faith he did it. Now here's where I want to slow down a little bit. Because... Many of you, if you've been in church, you're familiar at least with the outlines of that story. We understand the exodus. But I want you to slow down a little bit and think about this for a moment. Think about it from the standpoint of Moses. Think about it from the standpoint of the people. God told Moses to do something. Moses did it. We can even be numbed by it because the fact that Jewish people still celebrate the Passover now. It's interesting. I've known many Jewish people who would tell you they're not religious, but they celebrate the Passover. Exodus 12, 14 says, Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as the feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. 12, 24, And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. So by now... There's thousands of years of celebrating a Passover. Everybody understands what's going on, but take yourself back to that first event. Moses knew God could do anything. By this time, Moses had seen plague after plague after plague. But if you were one of the hundreds of thousands of people that were given this direction, doesn't it sound a little odd? He's going to save his house? We all have to get a certain type of animal. And yeah, we're going to eat it, but we've got to kill it a certain way. And then we've got to use it and we've got to put paint on our house. In fact, it's never happened in history. But while you're in 
your house, stay there. Because an angel of death, really the Lord himself, is going to come through and destroy. I can't even comprehend what I'd be thinking. I, I, I often d- reduce these things to my life now, and I can just picture Steve calling me, hey, Joe, hold on a second. I need to tell you something to do. I need you to paint your front door. What? Yeah, you need to kill an animal and get all the blood and put it around. What? That sounds bizarre. Egypt was powerful. They had a massive army. These were slaves. And you're telling me that my salvation's going to come by putting a little bit of a blood of an animal on my house? That's going to protect me from Egypt? More significantly, that's going to protect me from God? But Moses didn't hesitate. Moses took God as his word. I can't believe Moses could have understood all the implications. I'm certain that the nation of Israel wouldn't have fully understand the picture that would be one day of a different salvation by a different blood. But however strange it might have sounded, even if Moses didn't fully understand, you know what he did? He obeyed to the letter. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. Moses had to accept what God said. Not give me an explanation. How is this actually going to work? How is this going to look? What? No. Okay, this is what you tell me. This is what I will do. Remarkably for the nation of Israel and their future history of disobedience, Exodus 12, 28. Then the sons of Israel went and did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Israel was delivered. Israel was able to leave Egypt. Here's why that's an example for us. Here's why that's supposed to help us in this race. Here's why that's supposed to help us overcome entanglements and being tangled up with sin and and not growing weary. Because the fact remains, sometimes God's going to call you to do things from Scripture that won't make sense in your circumstances. Sometimes it's going to be in your personal life. God's going to tell you to stay married. But I'm not happy. But she's not very nice. But he's not very... God says stay married. God says discipline your children. Yeah, but they don't like it. And it didn't work. And they don't treat me nice after I do it. Guess what? God says it. Discipline your kids. Submit to the government. Well, but the government's really bad. And they're not good. And it's... uh, Submit. Why would God tell us to do these things? We don't always know. And for us, it's not always life or death. But the fact remains, if we want to get to the finish line, we just have to trust God, period. We just got to do what he says, even when we don't fully understand all the implications. And let me... Stop, it's not the end of my sermon, but it's a natural place to say it. Even what we believe is salvation doesn't make sense to the world. It sounds just as crazy to them as it might have sounded to us to say, put the blood of a lamb on the doorpost of your house when we say to them, the blood of the lamb was shed for you. The Bible says the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You know, nobody can be saved without believing the impossible. What's the impossible? That God would come to earth to redeem sinners like us? I mean, some people struggle with the whole idea of sinner. Am I really that bad? I'm better than him. I'm better than her. No, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're under the condemnation of God unless you apply some blood. Jesus willingly shed his blood for sinners. He's referred to as the lamb who was slain. It's that picture of the Passover. He took God's wrath. And as a result, we don't face judgment. 
let me encourage you, even if you don't fully understand, obey God's word, every bit of it. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And that includes the ones that we wish weren't in the Bible, that we don't quite understand, do it anyway. So a third principle for overcoming obstacles in the pursuit of obedience. First, fear God, not man. Second, obey scripture even when you don't fully understand. Third, physical danger is real, but God is trustworthy. Physical danger is real, but God is trustworthy. You just have to trust me as I develop this. Look at verse 29. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. Again, this is a brief summary of an event in history. And what the writer has done is now he's gone beyond just Moses' faith. And he's expanding it out and he's talking about when the nation of Israel did something together. It's a particular moment in biblical time. And if you wanted to read everything about it, you could go to, for example, to Exodus chapter 14. I'm just going to summarize some things. But the first nine verses or thereabouts reveal that when God pulled the nation of Israel out of Egypt, Pharaoh had said, you guys get out of here. God had Moses stop in a certain place because God wasn't done with Pharaoh. God was setting it up so that Pharaoh would give chase because Pharaoh was going to change his mind and God was going to deliver the people. And sure enough, Pharaoh was coming after Israel, and it wasn't to say a friendly goodbye. Exodus 14, 5 and 7 says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, What is this that we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? They realized they had lost their entire economy. They lost all their employees, except they weren't employees. They were slaves. So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him and he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them and they gave chase. And the way God designed it, Israel was backed up against a body of water. So Israel was stuck. You got 600,000 men, but they weren't soldiers, they were slaves. You got women and children. There was not a fighting man amongst the group. And they had nowhere to go. Behind them was water. And coming towards them was the Egyptians with chariots and with an army. Trained soldiers, animals prepared for battle, and a king who was really upset. And what was the reaction of the people? Again, when we see these statements that says they by faith did these things, we have to realize what leads up to it. What was the reaction of the people? <clears throat> Excuse me, Exodus 14, beginning at verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. In other words, what, we don't want to be free because it's just going to kill us. Now, I think if we were in the same shoes, much as we think their reaction was bad, we probably would have done the same thing. We're going to die. They're coming with an army towards us, and if we go that way, we drown, and if we stay here, they're going to destroy us. Thanks a lot, Moses. Appreciate it. Yet this group of grumbling cowards is about to be held up as an example of faith. What happened? Moses inspired them to trust God in this one instance. In spite of the very real dangers, those were real soldiers with real chariots, that really was water behind them. The danger was real. It was not irrational to think we're going to die because they were defenseless. They couldn't get away because there was nowhere to go, and they couldn't fight because they didn't even know what to do, and they had not a weapon amongst them. 
Verses 13 and 14 of Exodus 14 say what happened. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the, Egypt, for the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. And according to the text, God protected the Israelites until God was ready. He got between, he put a barrier between the Israelites and the Egyptians so they couldn't attack. And then he had Moses perform a miracle. Verses 21 and 22 of Exodus 14. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night. And turned the sea into the dry land, so the waters were divided. Verse 22, the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. That's what the author is saying in Hebrews eleven twenty nine. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. But again, think about this. The Egyptian army is still there. And now you turn around after a night of sleep, maybe you felt the wind, maybe not, and you look, and there's a wall of water on each side of you. Okay, who's going to go first? Because if that water comes in, and I've never seen water like that, so you take your wife and kids and you go. I can't even imagine that. With Debbie and my girls, and it's like, okay, but you just walk to the other side. What? What? That did take faith. Who had ever done that before? Nobody. And you still got the Egyptians breathing down your neck. And yet, over a million people who had been nothing but slaves listened to the word of God delivered through Moses. It took faith to take that first step. And yet, each one of them, one by one, did it. Using my imperfect analogy, they were making sure every one of them got across step by step by step, and they did. This doesn't minimize that later they were a rebellious generation. Most of the adults over 20 died in the wilderness because of their constant disobedience. But in this one instance, they believed God and they acted. They walked through by faith. They trusted that God was keeping the water up. They trusted that that dry land was going to remain there, and they made it. Contrast that with the Egyptians who had no faith. They had confidence in their chariots and their horses. Verse 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. The Egyptians saw the waters open wide, and for them it was like a highway. Perfect. We'll go get them. Exodus 14, 23, then the Egyptians took up the pursuit and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen went in after them into the midst of the sea. And then the Bible tells us that God messed them up. They started turning funny ways. Next thing you know, God brought the water and destroyed the entire army. God truly fought for Israel. The dangers were real. The water would have drowned the Israelites. The Egyptians would have killed the Israelites. But at that moment, they trusted God. God said, I'll fight for you. I'll take care of you. You just do what I said. You take the first step. And they obeyed. That's the encouragement to us. One of the things that I have seen over the course of my Christian life, and it seems like I was more aware of it, earlier in my Christian life were people that were telling you if you come to faith everything is okay that'll be the end of your problems our weekly prayer guide tells you that's not the case we have real physical issues not just our physical bodies breaking down and cancer and illnesses and heart problems and everything else but there's dangers all around us, real physical dangers. We have missionaries that every day are in danger of their life because they're in com countries where being a Christian can get you killed, where sharing your faith is punishable by death. 
And there are mission trips that Lakeside has gone on where it was dangerous. There were dangers involved. There are dangers all around us. Those are not fake. The key to faith is not pretending like they don't exist. The key to faith is saying, I trust God anyway. And if he called me, I'm going to go. And it may not be overseas and missions. It may not be passing through the Dead Sea. It may just be you go back to work at that place. And you keep being faithful despite what they're doing to you. And you keep being a witness in spite of what it's costing you. The hardships of life are not imaginary. They're real. But our God is greater than the hardships. Hebrews 13 elsewhere says, I will never desert you. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? I praise the Lord when we have good times. When I can celebrate with someone, when somebody shares a good thing and we're happy together. But I think we see more and more and more hard times. Because we live in a sinful world. Because we inhabit frail bodies because we live amongst wicked people and because we have an adversary of the devil that wants to destroy us. There are times when we're called to fear God, but we really fear people. When we need to obey, but we don't really understand, so we think we'll just save that one for later. Times when it could be dangerous, so we just shrink back. Let me encourage you in those times. We can trust God. He loves his children. He's there for you. He's there for me. He gave you his spirit as a helper. And no matter what Satan says or what this world wants to dish out, you're safe in the hands of your Savior. You can trust him. No matter what life sends at you, we have the promise of Jesus in John 10, 27, and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me, and I give eternal life to them. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are secure in you. Lord, so many times as we're running the race that you've called us to run, we trip over obstacles. And we fall down and we stumble and we trip ourselves with sin. And we run with fear, not with confidence. Lord, I thank you that even in those times you love us. You don't throw us away. But you give us one another even to encourage us. You give us examples like these from the great hall of faith that help us to press on. Lord, we don't want to grow weary. We don't want to lose heart. We don't want to be entangled. We don't want to be stumbling over sin. Lord, we want to serve you, but like Paul, far too often the things we want to do, we, we don't. And the things we don't want to do, we stumble into again and again. Thank you, Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us. That even... When we stumble and are faithless, you remain faithful. Pray, Lord, that you will help each one of us to leave here with a renewed sense of calling, a renewed sense of the need to obey, a renewed sense of the trustworthiness of your word and of you. And I pray, Lord, as we are a part of the body of Christ and as we make our way towards the finish line, you'll help each one of us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.